أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد السلام عليكم dear viewers and welcome to the show on Imam Hussein TV where we are exploring various aspects of the life and legacy of Lady Fatima Zahra عليه السلام and inshallah today we'll be looking at the concept and the idea and the story of Fedek and the usurpment of Fedek uh, and how uh, Lady Fatima عليه السلام responded uh, to this usurpment of course as we know uh, it was one of the greatest depressions and injustices done to say the uh, to say the fatima alayhi salam in her life and inshallah today we'll be exploring that uh, in greater detail inshallah to help me explore this topic is sheikh muhammad al-hilli salam alaykum sheikh alaykum salam thank you so much for joining us once again thank you uh, so inshallah when we when we talk about um the idea uh, of fedak i think we're quite well aware generally of the story uh, and what happened but in terms of discussing it specifically i think some people um might be weary of this discussion because they feel that it will cause uh, disunity given the figures involved uh, how would you respond to this bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa salli lahumma wa sallim ala muhammadin wa alihi at-tahirin wa la'natu ala ada'ihim ajma'in min al-an ila qiyam yawm ad-din it is of course uh, something that we have to tackle and address this concern because there will always be voices at the time of fatimiyah you know that we're going through at the moment and commemorating this uh, important days of the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the tragedy of Sayyidah Fatima. I look at it through a number of perspectives, through a number of ways. Number one, when I discuss Fadak or the attack on the house of Fatima sallallahu alayha or what happened to Amir al-Mu'mineen after the Holy Prophet's martyrdom, it is not a historical event. Mm. In my eyes, it's something that's connected to Aqidah, theology, jurisprudence, sociology, um, spirituality. It is a mixture of events. You know, when I discuss Fadek, I'm not talking about something that happened 1400 years ago. It has a lot of connotations to what is going on today, you know, in terms of e economy, in terms of who should we obey, you know, and, and, and understanding of the Quran as mm. well. So we cannot really isolate an event and say, it's happened in the past, let's forget it, let's move on. And the evidence for this is the Quran itself. If we had this kind of viewpoint where we say, whatever happened in the past, let bygones are bygones and discuss just what's happening at the moment. The Quran focuses a lot on history. The Quran discusses, for example, the stories of the prophets. Uh, in 72 occasions, the name Fir'aun is mentioned, mm. 72 in the Qur'an. Mm. You look at the, the, the nations that were destroyed by Allah, the non-prophetic stories, yes, people like, for example, Luqman, or uh, you have the story of uh, Ashab al-Kahf, and so on. If we're supposed to somehow say, but this might hurt some individuals, it might not be accepted by some, let's just leave it. You know, like the story of Khidr and Musa alayhi salam. Mm. It will hurt some people mm. because Khidr killed the 14-year-old boy. Mm. The Quran says, well, that's it. You have to deal with it, mm. seek lessons from it. Mm. We can't just say, oh, but people will think, what kind of barbarism is mm. this? No, let's understand it. Mm. What does it actually mean? Mm. That's number one. Number two, the reasons why I, I have to discuss Fadak and what happened to Sayyidah Fatima is that she he herself spoke out about it. Mm. The Ahl bayt spoke out about it. So if they spoke out about these things, shouldn't we also? Yeah. Don't we look at the Ahl bayt as role models, as individuals whom we try to emulate? If they spoke out against injustice, we have to do the same. The third reason why it's important to discuss Fadak and uh, what happened to Sayyidah Fatima is that if we don't talk about it now, we have future generations will be lost and will have no idea, no clue, because we somehow stopped talking about these subjects from the member or on uh, TV or on our websites, on social media, um, because uh, we are worried about the reaction of others. Mm. Uh, we have a responsibility to pass on the legacy of Sayyidah Fatima and what mm. happened to her because it has connotations to our lives. Mm. Wilaya and Bara'a. Mm. are part of furu' ad mm. It is not something that we can suspend for a certain period of time. Of course, we have to do it in a particular way that our ulama and our raja specifically have instructed and we are under their guidance on how these topics have to be discussed in a matter which, of course, uh, presents the facts and leaves people to make a decision about really what happened and who is to blame uh, and, and who was actually responsible. And the fourth point that I would like to highlight is the Ahl al-Bayt have said that we are followers that 
يفرحون لفرحنا ويحزنون لحزننا. We should be happy for the happy occasions and sad for the sad occasions. Just like how we commemorate the 10th of Muharram. Mm. Just like how we honor Amir al Mu'mineen, we have to honor Sayyidah Fatima and we have to remember what happened mm. to her. I think it's very interesting discussing Fedek because generally when it comes to um, theological and historical debates between uh, the two sects of Islam, and uh, we speak about Fedek, a lot of people ask the question, well, Fedek is just a land. What's the big deal? You know, why, does, uh, why did Sayyidah Fatima care so much uh, about this land? Um, so getting into this more, more in depth, what, did, what exactly was the land and what did it represent? Yeah. Uh, what, what, what benefits did it have? I think, you know, it's a very interesting question. And when people say it was just a, a land, it is, it is interesting because some scholars, unfortunately, uh, from uh, our brothers other schools, have utilized this point to weaken the image of Sayyidah Fatima in the minds of people by saying that, for example, Ibn Taymiyyah in Minhaj al-Sunnah, he attacks Sayyidah Fatima and says she acted the same way as the hypocrites acted. She wanted land, she wanted this dunya. She didn't obey the caliphs of her time, right? We have another respected scholar who loves the Ahl al-Bayt, but unfortunately mentioned something which is disrespectful to Sayyidah Fatima, and that's Tahir al-Qadri. Mm. Tahir al-Qadri, well known in Pakistan and even in many places in the West. He comes forward and says Sayyidah Fatima made a mistake. She should not have demanded for some land, Fadak. They and others have not understood Fadak. They think it's a piece of land, mm. but Fadak is principle. Fadak mm. is huge. Fadak mm. is about fighting justice. Fadak mm. is about God's law. Principle. It is. Mm. It's a matter of principle, not at that time, only all throughout mm. the uh, history. Now, when we look at Fadak, we recognize that it's a, a piece of land that is about 160 kilometers from the city of Medina, in, of course, in modern day Hejaz. And it was a very rich, fertile land covered with date palms and gardens and, and farms and so on. Um, it was rich in water sources and people say it was as rich as far as the palm trees as Kufa. Wow. You know, that's how it was. Um, of course, the Jewish community had lived there in the time until the time of the second Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab, who told them to leave, and that he asked them to pay fifty thousand dirhams each um, if they wanted to stay in the land of Fadak. Now, the major event was the year seven after Hijrah. Of course, the uh, Battle of Khaybar. Uh, the Prophet of Islam and the Muslims were victorious, um, and we know the uh, brilliant work of uh, and the bravery of Imam Ali alayhi salam in the Battle of Khaybar. Um, there were only two places that were left uh, that, uh, you know, uh, who surrendered to the Holy Prophet. And uh, the people of Fadak, who were 12 kilometers away from Khaybar, they heard at that moment when those two places that were left to the Prophet. And they came to the Prophet and said, look, we want to have peace with you. We don't want you to attack us. And this is um, the land. This is all for you. Um, it's not something that we're going to demand anything for. So it's known in uh, Islamic economics as fay because the verse in Surah Al-Hashr 6 to 7 says, Ma afa Allahu ala rasulih. What Allah gave to his messenger out of, you know, not cavalry, no need to fight for it, uh, is no, uh, fay and it belonged entirely to the Holy Prophet. Now, according to our teachings uh, and numerous other sources, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed chapter 17, verse 26, وَآتِ ذَا الْقُرْبَى حَقَّ Give the, your family what they deserve. Uh, uh, that Jibra'id said to Rasulullah, give Fatima the land of Fadak. And she made a number of people witnesses that she owned the land of Fadak. She placed some of her workers um, there and uh, she received the annual income, which she gave most of it for charity. Mm. Now, somebody may ask the question, 1726, this, are there scholars from our brothers who have actually said that this was revealed because Rasulullah gave Fadak to Fatima. Mm. Yes. Ibn Kathir, 
علامة جلال الدين السيوطي حاكم الحسكاني الراوندي uh, are in individuals from أهل السنة who have said that this verse was revealed to, to command the Prophet to give Fadak to Fatima. From our ulama, Allama Kulaini, Al-Ayashi, Al-Saduq, Al-Qummi. And you have, for example, prominent companions, Ibn Abbas, Abi Sa'id Al-Khudari, uh, amongst others, who noted and narrated this is the case. But remember, Fadak had such an incredible uh, income or, or source of income. Uh, we are told that um, uh, a hundred thousand. It was worth a hundred thousand dinars at that time, at least in terms of its value. And whoever owned it would have been quite powerful mm. in, in that sense. Because mm. today we realize, if you are, you know, a tycoon, that means you have land, you have businesses. In mm. modern day, yes, mm. that's how people are powerful and are able to make influences. Mm. And so, the ruling establishment, after the uh, sad demise of the Holy Prophet, recognized this. Mm. That's why they usurped it. Mm. I think that's very interesting because one thing people forget about it, like, like you mentioned, was how much. Uh, economy, <coughs> how much it helped the uh, economy in terms of how much money it was, it was uh, bringing in, and of course it's not about the idea of money, but that's ultimately where the power lies. So if someone wants to stay in power, they would need Fedek to help them. If they give Fedek back to Fatima, they would worry that that could be used to overthrow uh, them and give uh, Imam Ali Islam his rightful uh, place to uh, as leader. Um, but specifically in terms of the usurpment, what exactly uh, happened? How did they just steal it uh, from Fatima? Yeah. You are absolutely right in the sense that uh, this um, uh, commentator of Nahju al Balagha, Ibn Abil Hadid al Mu'tazili, uh, who is a Mu'tazilite, non Shia, is a famous commentary of Nahju al Balagha. When he comes to discuss Fadak, he says, My teacher told me that if um, the land of Fadak was not usurped and if they had given it back to Fatima, then they knew the next thing would be Khilafah. Mm. And, and that was certainly something that was documented and observed and certainly agreed by many people. Um, the workers of Sayyidah Fatima السلام, were driven out from the land mm. and uh, simply without any notice, without any consideration, uh, without any warning whatsoever, the land was uh, sadly confiscated and taken away by the first Khalifa Abu Bakr, supported by the second Khalifa Umar and the ruling establishment at that time. And of course, what is interesting to note is, today if you have somebody who is in possession of something, if somebody has something already, in Islamic law what you have to do is to try, you have to provide evidence if you believe that they are not the owners not that Fatima or whoever is the owner has to provide evidence that that's mm. hers. So, for example, if I'm holding this piece of paper mm. and you come to me and say, you know what, that's mine, mm. you have to show evidence. I don't have to show evidence this is mine. Mm. In Islamic law, the fact that I have it is sufficient to mean that it's mine. Mm. Of course, it could well be yours, but you've got to show proof. Mm. You've got to show me that it is yours. Mm. Yeah. And that's unfortunately something that um, did not happen mm. in that incident. You know, how quick after Rasulullah that basic Islamic laws were put to the side. Mm. Today, you know, one of the lessons I, I want to maybe throw in these lessons in our lives. People say, okay, you know, this person is a believer. He's practicing, he prays, he goes for Hajj, he goes Ziyara, he goes Majalis. But he's stolen this amount from me. Mm. Or he's taken a loan and he's not willing to give it back to me. Mm. For example, we have, we deal with these cases. And they wonder, you know, why? They're doing their salah. They're doing this. How can they do this? I don't get it. They're, they're religious. Mm. Yeah. There is one thing about, you know, having a beard or coming to mosque or showing that you're religious. Another, actually putting it in practice when push comes to shove. Imam al-Sadiq has this wonderful line, truly amazing. He says, when you look at someone, don't look at how much they pray or how long their sajda is. Mm. Look at where whether they are trustful and, truth, and uh, tr truthful. Are they trustworthy? Can you trust them in society? And do they utter the truth or are they liars? Mm. You know, the conduct is what matters. 
ultimately. And this is a problem we have in modern day era. When people see Muslims committing barbaric acts, you know, uh, uh, violence, terrorism in the name of Islam. Oh, but you know, they're Muslim, we can't say anything about them. They, they, they read Quran, they're good in that sense. It means nothing. Mm. If you're not going to put the Islamic principles in practice, then you're deceiving yourself. Because mm. you're deceiving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is not deceived, but you, you know, at the end of the day, you're not at all practicing what you are, uh, you know, supposed to be doing. Mm. So in essence, that's what happened after the Holy Prophet of Islam. Islamic teachings were put to the side. It's about ego, it's about materialism, it's about power. Mm. And I think uh, one thing we missed out on uh, was the fact that, um, if I'm not mistaken, one of the Khalifas uh, misquoted the Prophet uh, and, and said that uh, the Prophet said he does not leave behind inheritance, mm. if I'm not mistaken. Um, so um, it's also leading on to the next point, which is how uh, Fatul Zahar Islam responded. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to the issue of inheritance, um, which is actually a point, I guess, used by um, some scholars uh, uh, from our, our, our brethren in other sects in Islam uh, who speak about the fact that prophets don't in fact leave behind inheritance, so therefore she couldn't have inherited a fedak. How do we and how did she respond to that? It's very important for my dear brothers and sisters and all respected viewers to understand this next few points carefully because sometimes when you read the biography of Sayyidah Fatima or you hear a majlis, you're not sure chronologically how things worked. And maybe it's not clear about the case that is presented or what actually happened so that Sayyidah Fatima, you know, fought for her rights. Mm -hmm. You know, when we have a court case today, the lawyer presents evidence one after the other, and it's quite well structured. Sayyidah Fatima, in my understanding, had a three-pronged approach towards dealing with this injustice. It's important for us to understand all three and what she did in every stage of the way. The first thing she did was that she wanted to prove that this land of Fadak is hers. Mm. So it belonged to her, it was given to her by Rasulullah. And now her workers have been driven out. And so she sought to do that. How did she do that? She brought the very people who were witnesses. So they were Imam Ali alayhi salam. Asma bin to Umais. Asma bin to Umais, salamullahi alayha, was um, a tremendous personality because she was married to Ja'far al-Tayyar. Mm. And Ja'far al-Tayyar, uh, the brother of Ali alayhi salam, was martyred in the Battle of Mu'ta, eight after Hijrah. And then she marries the first Khalifa, Abu Bakr. And at this time, she's married to the first Khalifa. Yet she stood with Sayyidah Fatima mm. against her husband. Mm. Because she was a witness that Rasulullah gave Fadak to Zahra. Mm. Salamullah alayha. Asma bint Umais, Umm Ayman, Allah ta'ala alayha, uh, Imam al-Hasan al Hussein are all presented as people who were witnesses. Mm. Now, to me, as just a, a Muslim, just Amir al mumini just Al-Hasan, just al Hussein, even the other two, in fact, just Fatima is enough. Because people recognize they were the manifestations of truth. They were the embodiment of haqq. And for any one of them to come and testify. Mm. I mean, come on, a few years before they had heard Ayatul Tathir. Mm. They had seen the Prophet raise mm. them. They had seen the Prophet praise them. Mm. They had seen the Prophet say they're the best of the best. Mm. And yet when they all collectively give the testimony that mm. this land belongs to Fatima, mm. not a single testimony was accepted. Mm. Why? I, th I think, so. just uh, between your words, it's very interesting because it's almost a power play as well because having uh, that scene uh, of the, the family of the Prophet coming to uh, the, the, the new Khalifa to prove their case uh, switches the narrative completely. Uh, so it's in their interest to say, well, you know, obviously we're in power now. Uh, look, even the family of the Prophet is coming to us. Uh, uh, to, 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 to almost subconsciously recognize uh, our authority? Well, it's, they didn't recognize the authority. No, sorry, not recognize the authority, but yeah. the, fact, the, the narrative almost shows, uh, sorry, uh, it, it puts a subconscious narrative in the minds of the people uh, that their authority is now recognized. Well, th what they wanted to do was not to leave any stone unturned in the sense that if there was any way to demonstrate that justice has to be sought, they looked for it. Mm. And so, you know, sometimes there is dhulm, and you sit at home and you say, oh, there's so much dhulm. Mm. Okay, what are you doing about it? Mm. You know, go out there and change, make that difference. 
make that change. Mm. And so Sayyidina Fatima would want to do that, yes. So the idea that uh, they have to come, yes, they're, they're now the establishment, they have to go and uh, you know take their rights from them. Mm. Uh, it's not that they're saying you're the establishment, they're saying, okay, you've taken our lands. They could have might as well have been any Muslims yeah. who've come and taken the lands. Yeah. And Sayyidina Fatima would have done the same thing, yeah. brought these people as, uh, as witnesses. And so she did. What was interesting is that when, when she did bring those witnesses, initially, according to narrations, the first Khalifa Abu Bakr, he uh, said, you speak the truth. Mm. And he agreed. So he took this piece of paper. On his way, he was walking, and he was met by the second Khalifa, who, who looked at him and said, what is this? He said, this is testimony of these individuals that Fadak belongs to Fatima. Mm. So the second Khalifa took it and tore it. And, and and spat on it and said, no way, that mm. is not something that uh, can happen. So um, what was interesting was that Sayyidah Fatima is known as as siddiqa al-Tahira, mm. and yet, mm. even with those titles that the Prophet had given, she was pushed aside. Mm. Now, this did not deter um, Sayyidah Fatima from moving on. But just, just for information purposes, just for people to know, it's fascinating I found in history that the Prophet had given land to other Sahaba in his time that was not taken back. That's very interesting. Mm. So let me give you an example. Abdurrahman ibn Awf mm. and Abu Bakr were given uh, a land that belonged to Bani Nadir. Hamza ibn Nu'man was given Wadi al-Qura. Furat ibn Hayyan was given land in Yamama. Mm. None of these land was taken away after the death of the Prophet, mm. after the Shahada of the Prophet. None of them. Mm. And so that's something that is uh, very interesting. Um, the second area that, the Prophet, uh, that Sayyidah Fatima salam worked towards is to say, okay, if you're not going to accept that this land belonged to me, then at least you must accept its inheritance, as you mentioned. So inheritance was second, not first. You have to understand how it worked. Mm. So how did she do this? Well, she didn't only ask for Fadak, by the way. There was other inheritance that was due to her. For example, there was an area known as Hawa'atul Sab'a, the seven kind of walls that belong to the Holy Prophet, mm. three fortified castles in Khaybar, and a third of an area known as Wadi al-Qura. These belong wow. to the Prophet. Mm. And so she came and said, not only should Fadak be my inheritance, but part of these as well. Um, their response, of course, was this statement, they called the narration, that says, That we, the Prophet apparently said, that we are prophets, we do not uh, inherit uh, that which has been given to us as sadaqa. Mm. Or that we leave as sadaqa for uh, the people. So, she responded with great courage, determination, and fantastic eloquence in her famous khutbah, khutbah al-Fadakiya, which is much more than Fadak, by the way, has a lot of reasons why we do certain practices and so on, so on. and it's a khutbah that has to be read and contemplated upon in every occasion of Fatimiyah. This honoring of Sayyidah Fatima, sallallahu alayhi wa over these uh, weeks of Fatimiyah is an opportunity to read her legacy and to reflect upon these particular uh, uh, statements of hers, including her famous sermon. She had a number of sermons, but this was a famous one. In the statement, she argued, Allah says in the Quran, in chapter 4, verse number 11, يُوصِيكُمْ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ That everybody is uh, entitled to inheritance. Why should I not be? Because Quran is general about inheritance, isn't it? وَوَرِثَ سُلَيْمَانُ Dawood That Sulaiman inherited Dawood. I should also be inheriting my father. And she argued that this narration that prophets do not inherit is not accepted. Why? Because it's only Abu Bakr who narrated it. It's a khabar ahad, which means it's only narrated by one individual. Mm. And all of them, they're saying, we heard Abu Bakr say. Mm. Well, it cannot be something that we consider a major law mm. and a major action. And this hadith has been rejected by the Ahl al-Bayt, alayhum as mm. One final point about this inheritance thing, mm. and I know much can be said about this, is that if the Prophet did not leave inheritance. Why did his wife, wives inherit? Mm. A question to everyone. Mm. Why did his wives, such as Aisha and Hafsa and others, inherit Umm Salama? Why? What did they inherit? Well, they inherited part of the chambers that they lived in. 
you know the, you know they all and later of course wrongly uh, some of the wives of the Prophet would not allow Imam al-Hasan to be buried next to Rasulullah mm. because they said, no, that belongs to us. This is wrongly. But the point is that they inherited the Prophet. Mm. Why any of their inheritance was not taken away from them? Mm. So this is clear that it was a targeted thing against Sayyidah Fatima mm. salam, and they did not wish Fadak to be in the hands of Sayyidah Fatima because of political reasons that we knew uh, we discussed what they are. And the final area uh, of uh, approach that Sayyidah Fatima, three-pronged, remember, on fighting Fadak or getting fa back Fadak is that when Fatima alayhi salam says to them in a sermon, who knows about the Quran? You do or I? Mm. I am in the household that the Quran was revealed in. Mm. I'm the one praised in the Quran. Mm. You're telling me about the Quran? Mm. I'm telling you the Quran's is inheritance. Now, how did she do it? She said, I am entitled to Khums. Mm. Inherit the, 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 the idea of the Khums that I am entitled to because the Quran says in Surah Al-Infal, uh, The Qurba means that uh, it, it's the family of the Holy Prophet are entitled to Khums. Mm. So at least Fadak should be considered as part of Khums. Mm. Um, and that's why later on, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, maybe about 100 years later or less actually, would return back Fadak or mm. would want to return back Fadak to Ahl al-Bayt and he did for a few years because he realized that all this evidence uh, exists and that Sayyidah Fatima tried on different ways. And by the way, she would go around. Uh, narration says she would be riding a donkey and, you know, with her children, with Imam Ali alayhi salam, to the houses of the companions. And she would speak to them, reminding him about all this. Mm. Lest they say that no one warned us. Mm. Lest they say, you know what, it wasn't something that we were told about. Mm. It's all about giving the hujjah and the proof. Mm. In the last two or three minutes that we have left, tell us why is Fedek crucial today? Well, if today we come forward and we somehow accept that what was done in Fedek is okay, and we legitimize and are happy with the actions of the caliphs in usurping the land of Fadak. then what we have said, and I realize some people may not be comfortable with this, but this is the truth if you reflect on it, is that we have attacked Fatima. Mm. And basically we're saying that you're wrong. If we today somehow um, don't support what she stood for, then it's a demonstration of lack of love. Mm. It's, uh, it, it's the opposite, actually. She stood there demanding it for a reason. Let's not forget, and I genuinely believe this, if a poor person had come, knocked on the door, and said to Fatima, I want the land of Fadak, mm. Fatima would have given it. Mm. Here is a lady who gave her wedding dress on her wedding night. Here is a lady who gave an expensive necklace to a poor. Here is a lady who for three days gave all their foods and did not have anything to break their fast. Mm. Why would she not give Fadak? Mm. Fadak was not about materialism, was not about this world whatsoever. These are Ahl al-Bayt who have detached themselves from this dunya. They want servitude to Allah. They want the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The lesson to learn from Fadak is that we see today a lot of oppression. We see rights of people taken away. Number one, we should not be people who practice dhulm on others. If we unfortunately have usurped something from someone else, even if we have usurped their reputation, remember, it's not only physical. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we've destroyed someone's somehow image in society. That is usurping the haqq. We have to work to restore it, correct it, apologize and do whatever is necessary. Mm -hmm. We see around the world oppression that's happening in places such as, for example, China. The Uyghurs, the Muslim Uyghurs. Um, we see oppression happening in Yemen. We see oppression happening in Pakistan and Afghanistan and in Iraq and, and in Syria and other places. Silence is not an option, especially for people around, you know, countries where you can speak out. You can contact your local um, congressmen or women in America or MPs in this country or parliamentarians. Whatever is necessary, writing letters, campaigning, financially assisting and helping to stand against dhulm is the message of the Ahl al-Bayt is the ethos from the 10th of Muharram is what Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam wanted to ingrain and inculcate in our spirits in our hearts mm. and at the same time 
we have to realize that we are responsible as protectors and defenders of Ahlul Bayt mm. salam. Theologically, the subject of Fadak means a lot to us. Mm. Why? Because it highlights the battle of the truth and it highlights how wilaya extends throughout centuries. And wilaya for us is a red line. Mm. We will necessarily, you know, have a discussion with our brothers, al-Sunnah, others, we sit with them, we can pray with them and so on and visit their places and so on and have a brotherhood relationship in that sense. But we cannot compromise when it comes to the aspects to do with Ahl al-Bayt salam, including Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam. And this is key for our future generations mm -hmm. to understand that we have to be the ambassadors of Ali Muhammad in ensuring that what happened to them is preserved and is presented to the masses. Ahsan to Sheikh. Thank you so much. That was a very inspiring uh, conclusion uh, by dear guest, uh, Sheikh Mohammed al Hilli. Uh, of course, in these episodes, we are exploring the life and legacy of Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. And in the next episode and the final episode uh, of this series, we'll be looking at the Salah of Fatima and what we can learn uh, from this fantastic lady. Inshallah, we'll see you then. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.